We're going to spend some time over the next uh, year in uh, 2024 and into 2025 talking about all kinds of things Ortonville. We're going to kind of work outside that a little bit. We're getting a chance to talk to uh, Nick Grant today, and we're going to talk Constitution, which may sound like a boring subject, but I think when Nick gets done explaining what he wants to uh, inform us about, it's kind of a really unique um, mechanism that's really gaining popularity across the country. And so, first of all, Nick, you're from Ortonville. Yes, I am. And your original captain, and I want to make sure I say it right, it is the, your organization. The Convention of States. Convention of States. So let's start with the most, the, the simplest of questions. What, in fact, is the Convention of States? Convention of States is a, a, a movement, a project that was initiated by a guy by the name of Mark Meckler. Uh, you may know the name from days of the Tea Party, those kinds of things. Mark is a constitutionalist, a constitutional scholar, an attorney. 2013, as he looked at the landscape and the way things were functioning in this country, specifically in Washington, D.C., he started looking for, with some of his colleagues, for a solution to what he saw going on in the Capitol. Okay, so we can all agree on either side of the aisle that there's a lot of us that are not happy with the way things have been running and been, maybe been running for a while. Sure. So there's a mechanism within the Constitution. Am I, am I right on this so far? Yes. That allows, okay, so let's talk about the mechanism, and then we can talk about the, the results and the cost and effect of what that mechanism means. Within the Constitution, there's actually a way when the framers wrote it to give the regular folk like us, a chance to at least have a voice beyond our normal representatives. Is that fair? That is correct. Okay, explain what that is. Okay, just days before the framers finished work on the Constitution in 1787, George Mason stood up and said, hey, we left something out here. We've created all of this structure on how to initiate and, and, and grow our government, but we've left something out in that if as we have experienced, and these are his thoughts more or less, as we have experienced, if the government goes out of control, there are no means by which the people can rein it back in. And out of that discussion, and it didn't take very long, was born Article 5. Okay. Article 5 details two ways you can amend the Constitution of the United States. That's not changing word one in the 4,000-word document. It is amending it as it has been done 27 times. It just gives you and I, we the people, the ability to do that, bypassing Washington, D.C. and the governors of the states. I think there would be those that argue that Washington and the surrounding areas is a little bit isolated and maybe an island onto its own. Sure. I think that's a fair non-political statement on both sides of the aisle. Yep. So with this mechanism that's in place with Article 5 as part of the Constitution, you now have that at least the vehicle to allow for conversation. Right. So now explain what your organization has done using that mechanism. You guys have had a grassroots growth of this membership and this organization. How many members? When did it start? And sort of give us the, the, the gist of that process. Okay. Well, it began in 2013. Very slowly, of course, uh, it has grown today in all 50 states. We are in all 50 states. It's essentially the same organization, state to state. We have a state director. We've got regional captains. We've got district captains. So it's pretty much the same state to state. So we're active applying Article 5. The point to what we're doing, our mission is to inform, engage, and educate at the grassroots level about specifically Article 5, but of course the Constitution as we do this, all right? So we use that in forming our grassroots, bringing in volunteers, and then exercising through our volunteers and the grassroots to influence the state house legislators. We have to do the same thing there. We've got to ed inform them, educate them, and engage with them, get them to support the creation of a resolution within the state house to support calling for a convention of states. We have to have 34 states to sign on. 
before the convention can be called. Michigan is still in the wings. We're still, still trying to get that done. Uh, we're, we're, we're hopeful that as we go into 2025, depending on how things go in the election this fall, that we may be able to move Michigan forward. Okay. So right now there are 37 states involved that actually have, that are moving towards having an organizational process within the-, the... Well, there's 19 that have passed it. We've got okay. another five thereabouts who have it in various stages of passage in the local state houses. You know, it, it requires a hearing in a subcommittee first, then it comes out of subcommittee, and then it's put out on the floor of the state houses for a vote. So at this point, we have 19. We've got about five that are pretty darn close. So we're expecting somewhere by the end of the year, we're going to be at about 24, 25 people who states who have passed this. We need the 34. So we're going to need about 10 more after that. Okay. I want to get into the sort of the minutia, but I want to ask you a couple more mechanical questions. Sure. One, when you get a state house to agree to this convention of uh I'm, I'm not saying it right. Convention of Convention of States. That's right. Convention of States. You're that's that house, that state house is giving you some a certain amount of power. Have you found that that they don't necessarily want to give that up as part of that discussion? Because all of a sudden they're they're not necessarily being represented by those who voted them in. Well, I don't know that, that they see it necessarily. They, they, to some extent, that's true, Greg. Uh, if if this works. You know, there's there's a threat, not so much to the state representatives as the federal. The federal people are the ones who are going to work against this, even oppose it. OK, OK. Uh, but you've got folks in this in, in, in Lansing today, Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter who don't see this as viable. They've got all kinds of arguments against it. So it's not so much them giving up power because this it, when it's all said and done, this will bring more power back to the states. Okay. Okay. If, if you if you address this and and we're successful in you know say reducing the size of the government, that's going to go somewhere and it's going to come back to the states. Okay. So you now have you represent as a regional captain. You represent a large contingent of sort of southeastern Michigan and the Thumb area and up near up through Midland. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Thirty thirty one county house districts. Okay. In Michigan, how many active members are a part of your organization? Active members are on the order of about 300, three to 400. Lot. That's a lot. It is. Yeah, you know, we've got now, I'm sure the number the, the number of supporters, petition signers and all is in excess of 100,000 people. Okay. So again, let me get back to the mechanical for a second. You get, at some point when you get to 37, you're going to get a house of states, a convention of states. Get to 34. Give us an idea within that conversation of what you're looking for to influence, change, or alter? There's three legs to this stool as it goes. Uh, the first one, of course, everybody knows, everybody agrees is term limits. Hmm. Term limits are not it necessary. Yeah, you know, well, they're not limited to just the politicians. Right. When you start talking term limits, it could be judges. It could be appointed people. So term limits, you know, depending on what the body can agree on, will encompass more than just the politicians themselves. You certainly don't need politicians in Washington, D.C. there for 40 and 50 years, okay? So we're going after that as terminus. So that's one. Okay. The second thing, the second thing is to go at this fiscally. Address the money. Address the finances. Simple things like perhaps a, uh, a balanced budget amendment, okay? I mean, that's just not necessarily something they're going to do, but that's one of those things that could happen out of this. You've got to balance your books. Okay. So you address it from a fiscal point of view. And then the third thing is to reduce the, the size and scope and the reach of the federal government. Personally, I think if we do a good job on the monetary side of it, the financial side of it, the size of government will be taken care of. Okay. From your perspective, and, and hopefully as a spokesperson for the group, what would be something at the federal level you would like to see reduced? This ah. is an example. Okay. Uh, Department of Education. Okay. Think about... Think, go should ahead. There be a, 
Should there be a state part the Department of Education? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Who who is better equipped to know what our kids need? You know, you've got all these federal programs, leave no child behind, you know, coming out of the Bush era. You know, you look at all of these federal programs and the money that they throw at education, and why does this country rank in the middle at best as far as quality outcomes in education for things like math, science, and reading? We're throwing all this money at education and our people, we aren't at the top in the world. Okay, that's a that's a fair argument. So you're basically talking three things that are pretty non-political. They're right. sort of, and let me, and I'm, and I'm not gonna editorialize, but it, it kind of common sense. Sure, sure. So when you, and the reason I'm qualifying that process is because I don't think there's anybody that doesn't agree that 96 year old, you know, senators or congressmen who've been there since, you know, the Civil War. That, that makes sense to me. Right. I don't think it makes sense to you. But then the other argument to that might be, well, what about somebody who has been in the job for a while who might understand how it works? Because he's had the experience. And that's certainly an argument in that in that other end. But then yeah. I look at somebody like Diane Feinstein, who recently, you know, unfortunately she pa passed. But the last seven or eight months of her, her, her tenure as a senator... I mean, it was just, it was sad for her and it wasn't sure. representative of the, of the district or, the, you know, the state that she represented. It was tough. So term limits right. would fit to those kinds of situations. There's Absolutely. Plenty of, there's plenty of people that are older that are successful and they can, they're cognizant. Look at us. I mean, we do pretty good. Yeah. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that I'm going to, you know, an 85 year old guy is going to be as functional as a guy that might be 60. Well, and, you know, and that, you know, this whole thing about people being too old, you know, you got to be careful with that. You know, you could... You could have, if, if we were successful with term limits and say we come up with a number, a person in their 60s could, could run for office yeah. and still qualify, you know, even though they're in an older age category. So you, we have to be really careful about who's qualified and who's not and how you determine that, okay? So, I mean, that's, that's probably a topic you know, for a, a different discussion. No, no, and, I, and, that's, and I'm just, you know, I get that. So I, the reason I'm asking the questions that in relationship, this really isn't, it sounds like it might be a political organization finding with a political bent, but it really is a common sense approach to using a mechanism that allows the everyday guy to figure out a way to get to those who make the rules and, and those who write the rules. I think that's something that yep. gets lost maybe in this discussion. Yeah. And then when you're, is it fair to say that when you're having those conversations with people that educating them about, about article five is probably a bigger job than the actual subject matter that you're discussing? a huge job you're right yes you know folks uh you know for all kinds of reasons you know you go through school and you forget you don't remember the things you were taught and in some cases today they don't teach government like they used to so people are coming kids are coming out of school and they really don't understand government finance or the constitution and so sure we've got to spend a fair amount of time re-educating a lot of folks as to what they have before them as an opportunity here. You know, we're we're not, you're right, we are not a political organization in the purest sense of the word because our charter, we're, we're a 501c3, c4 type organization. And as a 501c3, we can't behave in a partisan manner. I can't support a specific politician, Republican or Democrat. I can't do that while I'm wearing the hat. Right. And, it, and I asked the question because the origin, as you mentioned, was from maybe it was part of the Tea Party as in terms of discussion to get it off the ground. But all the other you know, qualifiers and, and qualifications and requirements require you to be down the center of the center of the road to be able Absolutely. to have the conversation. Yeah. The, the Tea Party, you know, the, let's not connect the Tea Party because that was very much a political operation. Right. That's why I'm saying, what I'm it's saying. Just, the guy, Mark Meckler, just happened to be part of that. And he jumped out of that whole effort and began this convention of states effort. So as you go out and solicit and and you know assist with trying to make and spread the word, how much, how many is it difficult to sell Article Five? And I don't mean sell it. How many people just don't know it? I would, you know, speculation on my part, but it's way more than half the people we engage with. You know, That's we're right. probably up, we're probably up in the sixty percent range. E either they don't understand it or they don't want to be bothered. Okay, well, that's a fair argument. 
I put the Constitution up behind me as, as a, you know, just as, as a preamble because I, I, I'm a, I think I'm a fairly smart person, but I had to go back and read a little bit about Article Five. Right. So again, that becomes the first stumbling block before you worry about term limits and any other sort of specific changes. Sure. Have you guys speculated on a time frame of as you're building this from 2014? Is like you said, 2025 or 26? You're hoping to have some kind of a uh, sort of a consensus of getting the 37. Is that is that a is that a fair time frame? Uh that's probably a little tight, you know. And it's it's really hard to even predict what that's going to be. It's you know, given the way elections go, and and you know, the the thing that probably has the most profound effect on what's going on is in fact the behavior of our politicians. You know, as that, as that, um, depending on how you see it, right. as that deteriorates, that's going to, as, as, as you can see in many instances, it's going to generate a lot more interest in bringing about change. And, and this is change that's done in a very peaceful way. Right. The, you, you I think, would agree that there's certain things the national, that the federal government has to do that state, state states can't do. I think you could recognize yeah, that. Yeah, that's called out in the Constitution. Obviously, Michigan can't declare war on Germany, you know, Correct. As, as an example. Yes. Uh, the more power in your mind, the more power that goes back to the states, local control, which is certainly a valid argument, has yep. been a, has been a 250 year argument. You know, we, we we go back all the way to the, you know, the 13 colonies. The advantage, I would assume, is that you can make local decisions. The downside is you were mentioning education about term limits. It becomes sort of the minutiae because if you're if you're if you're trying to persuade people that don't really know first of all the article then they add to that so education is probably is it fair to say education is probably about 90 percent of the time of what you're doing as part it's of your huge part it's a huge part of what we have to do absolutely i would think like me because you had a conversation with us uh probably a month or so ago and we wanted to sit down and have this right. conversation right when you first started talking i was like well you know here comes another one of those one of those guys on whatever side of the aisle. Yeah. yeah. As, as I as I as I read more, I, I, where do I sign? I mean, it's just it's common sense. Is, it that, really is. is that is that a pretty typical reaction that you get? Yes, it is. Once you once you get a person to hear what you have to what we have to say and and get through the explanation on the process and and the outcomes and the goals and you know people get excited. They do. I was at a gun show in Flint this past weekend, and we had a couple of folks come up, and we went through our our, our presentation to them there at the table, and boy, they were just excited as all get out to sign our petition and support what we're doing. So yeah, once they hear the full story, you know, people get pretty excited. The thing that people were often presented with from people is the misinformation that's out there. Of course, we we live in an age of misinformation. Okay, give me an example for your organization. You hear a lot. We're going to do away with the Second Amendment. Okay. And you did not hear in any of those three things I talked about earlier, you heard nothing about the Second Amendment. Right. right. We're not going to go anywhere near the Second Amendment. Right. Okay. You know, people worry about you call this convention and it's going to get chaotic and it's going to get out, get out of control. It's just not going to happen. There are rules, there are regulations, there's procedures, there's protocols. You watch C-SPAN or any of these, any government hearing, and they're very ordered, very controlled, very in command, okay? Now, it's just, that's just a basic fundamental thing. Okay. But you hear this a lot. So you get these groups, and let's just move us down a road, maybe eight or 10 years, and all of a sudden you've got the convention, you've got 37 states. I would think- 34. Say 34. 34. My mistake. My mistake. So you have 34. You you get a chance to maybe have, I'm assuming you're approach, approaching people in Lansing and other state capitals that are at least of like mind. Right. Now you get to Washington and say, oh, by the way, we're going to reduce all of your, uh, or at least we're looking at reducing your opportunity. I got to believe that the next step when you get to the convention of states becomes the government itself as the, as the dam in the water, so to speak, and dam in the river. Because they're not going to give up. There's no possible way they're going to give up control of what they do. Right. What becomes then the sort of methodology or the psychology once you get to the Convention of States and you get to the number of 34, 
Have you guys thought about what happens when you actually have to go to the next step beyond that? Is that something you guys have even contemplated? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you go through Article 5, you know, it 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 informs you as to the role the federal government play, plays in all of this. And that's a very minor role. You know, the convention gets called, they propose the amendments, <coughs> excuse me, and those have got to then be sent out to the states for ratification. So the only role, there's two roles for the government. They have to call the convention when we get the 34 states. And then when the amendments are proposed and ready, the government has to distribute those to the states for the final ratification by 38 states. Okay. So the, ro the role of federal government is very small in this, if any. I would think if you got to 34, getting to 38 and getting an approval of 38 wouldn't be that difficult because I think the first 32 are pretty tough. Uh, the first 25 are tough. Okay. Is the approval, what am I looking when I ask this question? Is the as, as it, we are a very much regional country, obviously, geographically, we're, sure. we're, we're, sure. we're different from, you know, as they say, C, C to signing C. Right. Is there a movement? Is it unique? Is it is it is it a sort of a cluster or is it does it seem to be more east, more Midwest, more west? Is there a is there a pattern to where you're getting support? Well, the the, the, the earliest returns are from conservative states you know the term red states okay so those are going to come first but they don't come easy you've got a lot of uh, conservative minded folks who can't find a way to buy into this as yet okay the liberal side of it you know want nothing to do with this so if you go to uh, a state like new york or california and we're there and we're working but they're not going to call for the resolution. They're not going to sign on as one of the 34. They will be at the convention, however, when it gets called. Okay? They could send any number of people they want to the convention, but each of the 50 states get one vote. How steep a hill do you feel like you're pushing up a rock against? I'm curious. In Michigan, it's tough. Okay. Real tough. Texas, not so much, because right. that's a pretty conservative area. That's where Mark Meckler is from. But Michigan is tough. I mean, it's you know, it's a it's a purple state. It's you you you've got your blue areas in Michigan. You've got your red areas. Uh, so Michigan is tough. We've been, we've been trying in Michigan since 2017, I think. We've had the resolution uh, before this prior election, we actually had a resolution for calling the convention on in, in one of the subcommittees. And of course, with the election, all that went away. The conversations we've been having as a country over the last four or five years, I would think that getting together with the membership in, that you that you are involved with would almost be like a psychological self-support group just to be able to <laughs> share stories and you know, I'm sure everybody's got a war story about this, that, or the other. But oh yeah, if you honestly, right. if you honestly look at it and wipe away your personal political feelings, it really is a nonpartisan operation. It really is. Truly, truly is. I, uh, you know, I, I, I work personally. I work really hard at, and we pretty much do this here in Michigan, at stay staying in the middle. You know, I, I will not, you'll not hear me talk about who I support or what I think about this candidate or that candidate. I just don't do that. I don't want to be identified with a politician, a party. I just, I won't allow myself to do that. And and, and, and that affords me the ability to talk in a very nonpartisan way and answer people's questions and concerns. Okay. They have so, so let me, we're doing this interview we're a, a small cog in a very large wheel. Hopefully, you know, all 12 of our viewers will watch it. Yep. Um, again, that's, uh, you know, we have the same audience, I'm guessing, as, you know, PBS, but the, the, I'm joking. But the point I want to make is if you're talking to us, and I'm a fairly red person, I, until we had a conversation, I was not a worry organization. So without picking on your organization, your membership, I would think that communications and certainly public relations would have to take a, a fair, you know, step forward to get more people to know what it is. Yes. So yeah. what is that effort? And if it's not successful or it isn't being successful, what is it, 
what do you need to do to, to get more people online and to, at least to know what you're trying to do? Well, uh, when we started back in 16 in Michigan, you know, the organization was much different than it is today. We've grown tremendously in that time. But to me, one of the things we've done that has moved the ball, given us more leverage, is things like this. Okay. We are we have a tremendous communications team. We have a lady who is our state communications director, and she is just pushing to get the word out on all forms of media, social media, print media, in the airwaves, uh, anywhere we can, we are using these tools to get our message out. You know, it used to be all we did was invite people to come to a meeting and talk. And we still do that. But we've just increased our exposure and our leverage a tremendous amount with the addition of this new strategy. When you guys have meetings within the group, are there interesting differing opinions about the three legs of the stool that may not be two term limits or maybe other? Is it is it a wider a landscape of what's possible if you ever do get to the convention of states? Where the where the width comes in, Greg, is not in e either of those three elements as it is in the specifics under each one of them. Okay. People have a lot of different ideas on what term limits mean, okay? I, I've talked to a number of our state reps, and we have term limits here in Michigan, of course. And, you know, as you talk to them, you raised it earlier. You know, you don't want to have somebody in and out so quick that they can't be effective. They've got to be there long enough to learn a job and then to be able to do it. So, you know, there's you, term limits is great. We're going to go and work on that at this convention, but how many years, how many times, you know, that's the real, that's where the, the, the rubber meets the road. And that's where you've got a lot of different views on how to do it. There was a politician from the Flynn area that was in office for about 40 years. And in his 40 years, I'm not going to get specific names. Yep. He's a son who's a current congressman, but yep. the father wrote two pieces of legislation in 40 years. There was never a better guy to call you back to make sure you he had a voice in Washington, but literally was the consummate ghost uh, or chameleon that, that blended in with the wall. He, he never he never had a bad word. He never had a good word because he never had any words, but he always got reelected because he never upset, you know, never upset the, the apple cart. Yep, yep, yep. It's hard to be a law. It's hard to be, a, you know, a politician. More importantly, it's hard to be a public servant and somebody writing laws if you don't have some insight to what you know kind of goes through it that, yep. that's the reason i'm asking the question is that the concor the cornucopia of of opportunity of talking about a variety of things would be i think it would be more, more difficult if you do get to the convention of states because everybody's going to have an opinion about probably sure. 20 you know legs on that stool that makes it even more yeah. difficult but well, the, the, the thing we have to do in this country, and it's not just with Convention of States, is we have to figure out how to make our diversity work. Okay. Is your group primarily older, middle-aged, younger? Or is it a collection of everybody? Well, it's 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 more on the older side of things. You know, you know we're, I'm retired. I, I have time to do this. Working folks, they've got less time to do something like this. But we we've also got another effort uh and afoot here to reach out and touch younger folks we're uh we're trying to uh co you know work with different coalitions in the state one of which is turning point you know i went oh three weeks ago now to a turning point meeting in at michigan state university you know they got a chapter there and i went as a convention of state person mostly to learn but also to uh, meet and understand some of the folks at that local chapter because I, I I have responsibility over that way. So we are working to try and get at the younger population, and that's a that's probably the toughest nut of all to crack. It, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily if they don't think it affects them because when they until they have families it doesn't really matter. And then when they have families, well, it, yeah, they don't have the life experiences yet. Most of them to understand what pickle they're in.
Right. Well, the old joke used to be if, if you have a child, you automatically become conservative Republican just because you're, you're paying house bills and baby bills and, and all the things. Yeah. That so yeah. I've, I've certainly I've certainly heard that argument. What's yep. next for you? And maybe more importantly, what's next for uh, over the next between now and the end of 2024? What give us a little highlights of what's uh, what's going on? Sure. Uh, our state director, Sarah Santana, has us working on two fronts, both uh, important here, but you know, building relationships is at the top of our list. We have to build relationships with the people in Lansing, and that's not just the uh, legislators, but their staff aides, their staff heads, building those relationships. And then of course, we've got to build those relationships with our volunteers, keep them engaged, get them more engaged, keep that pressure going toward Lansing so that you know we're building relationships as we go forward. The other part to this, there's, there's actually several elements. We've all written our business plans and what we're going to do this year. I have one. My team has their individual plans and what they can accomplish. But uh, probably the next thing in line is we've got to make sure we grow the infrastructure. You know, the district captains, the region, more more regional captains, more legislative liaison folks. We've got to grow those teams as well. And, 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 and as you do that, of course, you know, you just leverage the whole message more and more, the, the more you can grow that. So, you know, we've got 110 house districts in Michigan. We need to have a district captain in, in every one. Will we get there in 2024? No, but we ought to be able to, you know, in my own personal goals, I have said to my boss, I'm going to add five more district captains and five more house districts this year. I think that's doable. Maybe this is an unfair question. I'm curious. When you approach, when you have approached guys at the state legislatures, are Republicans or Democrats is either side, are you looking for a particular political party? Is, is there one political party that might be more receptive than the other? Well, the Republicans generally are more receptive. You know, the, the Democrats, not so much, uh, you know, my in my experience, and I go to Democrat meetings. I do. I mean, I go there to learn and understand, you know, and 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 to talk. And so the Democrats collectively are difficult, but individually, not so much. You know, if you, when you start talking about this in a nonpartisan sense, nonpartisan manner, it's pretty hard to argue with what we're trying to get across as a message here. Yeah. So it, 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 I think you said it earlier. It is just common sense. Is it fair to say, too, that the rhetoric from some political discussions doesn't really hit you, your guys as you go out in the public? Because, again, it's not as once you start talking about it and somebody explains it to you, it probably doesn't have the flames that some other discussions might have. Is that fair? No, it, it doesn't quite have that kind of effect. You're right. You know, it's the, the thing we deal with the most, be it Republican, Democrat, whoever is the misinformation. Yeah. And yeah, well, we're unfortunately working in, in a world at the moment where <laughs> water isn't wet and the sky sometimes isn't blue. Yeah. And and I, thought there, I thought there'd be some things that we could, are, could agree upon, but I'm pretty sure that uh, there's those folks who tell you that water isn't that, in fact, not wet, but that's, that's the way of the world. Well, is. and it, you know, you're right. I mean, it's, I mean, I, in, in people close around me, you know, you know, that, that what tends to happen in, in some cases is, they're they're too willing to accept what comes in over the airwaves as fact. Okay, they don't do their homework. They don't look at the other side of the issue. They only have one side. They only see one perspective, and that's all they know. Sure. Have we missed anything to, that you wanted to maybe pr pr portray to the public? Well, I guess I, the thing that, to me is is significant for people who might be watching this is these things don't happen just talking this requires people who will get up off the couch go out into the neighborhood and talk to other people you got to engage in a live face-to-face -face manner if this is ever going to work you know, you can email, you can text, you can do all those things, and that's great. You get the message around, but in the end, it's talking face-to-face, -face, my view at least, 
And that's where you're going to have most of your success. And that's what we try to do. Would it be fair, though, before they go out and talk, to they at least read Article 5? <laughs> I, I would encourage everybody. To, it's not that long, and it wouldn't take you that long to read it. It, it would be very informative. And it's also not a solicitation for money because, as you say, you're a nonprofit, but the reality right. is it's operational dollars. So this isn't a, like a maybe a religious thing. You're not asking for donations. You're asking no, well, people to the, support. The, the, the C4 side of it will. I, I'm not involved with the C4 side of it. You know, they handle that on a national basis. So, yes, they've got their do uh, people who donate and they solicit, but that's not my job. I don't do right. that. I'm, what I'm saying is that there's not going to be somebody knocking on your door telling you about Article 5 and then on the other hand. Oh, no, no, no. That, no. And that's my point. No, no, not at all. Not at and that's, all. And I think that's an important point to make because it's a little easier to talk to somebody about this subject without having to worry about feeling yes. obligated to, you know, to, do, to to open the wallet, so to speak. And that's why I'm I just here. I just need their time. Yep. I don't get that. I get that. Well, right below you is the um, website. So anybody wants to contact the national organization, they can do that. It's available. And uh, Nick, is there a statewide website or is it a national website only? No, we have a state website. Okay. And we'll it put is. that we'll put that up at the end of the show. So if they want to okay. get information, they can contact you guys through that. Yep. And uh, I'm sure that you guys will respond to anybody that's interested. If, if they contact us, if they contact me, they're going to hear from me. Good. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on for the uh, first Ortonville tonight conversation. This is, uh, we're going to try and do some conversations with folks over Zoom from the area that have different views and ideas about a variety of things. We may be talking to a uh, Article 5 guy on the first show, but hopefully we'll have some other folks on. So uh, the best of luck. We appreciate it. And uh, hopefully this informs some folks. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Greg, thank you for having me.